Tacoma Park is a, is, 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 a, is a great town. But it's a good place, good place to live. How can you beat this place so close to D.C.? When I came here, it was almost like a culture shock. Jewish families or Czechoslovakian families or people from London, England, you know, from all over the world. Like a lot of town, whites live one area, and then you had spots of people who are African Americans. It is different. When you look at all the things the Coma Park has done and changed, oh God. Democracy! 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 It's a good place. It has its issues. Yes, it does. Like all places, like all families. At some point, you thought whites in the Coma Park back then, they just tolerated you. That's a bad word. Somebody tolerates you? Just because of my skin color? The 60s, the 50s, and on back. We had a good feeling what racism was about. But that's the way it was. Lee Jordan was my father. He was a janitor. He was the head custodian at the Tacoma Park Element, uh, Junior High School. At the time, that was the name. He loved his job. He did it well. Here was a gentleman that, quote unquote, he was a custodian. Okay, some people want to say janitor of the school, Cone Park. And you know how sometimes that stigma, there's stigmas that sometimes go with that, good and bad. There's no bad stigma with Mr. Lee Jordan. He made what he did look brilliant. You would always think that uh, a principal in the school would be the head guy. When there was an issue at Tacoma Park Junior High, you would always hear, Mr. Jordan, can you please come to the office? Kids who got into a, a, a lot of trouble, they went to that office and the principal basically wouldn't deal with it they would call Mr. Lee. I don't care how loud we were or how noisy we was, he would walk in a room and wouldn't say a word, but you would hear everybody calm right now. Mr. Jordan was the one who handled the problems for the principal. You had a son that wasn't into nothing or doing nothing, the parents would turn him, turn him over to you. They turned him over to Mr. Lee. 
We were breaking into the school. Breaking in there, that's what we were doing. We would sneak in, and he would be in there working, and he heard somebody at the gym. He knew we were doing wrong, but his heart was in the right place, and he just says, don't go anywhere else in this building. Y'all just stay in there. So we'd be in the Cone Park Junior High playing ball, yeah, while he was working. And so he would open it up for us sometimes, a lot of times, not sometimes. It was a couple of nights during the week. We would play and then he'd drop us all home, right at our door and wouldn't wait. He would wait until we got in the house. That's how, to a point, he was the founder of the Black Boys and Girls Club. He started teams for the black kids that wanted to play on these teams, which were predominantly white. He made sure that we would have a place to play and practice. We could get to the, the games. And he'd keep you in line, because when we act up, he'd tell you straight up, you're not going to do that. You're not going to do that. Stop it. Especially in the hallway. And he's in the hallway. He would get hard on you, but he did it because he loved you. And that, those influences transferred to the young folk. People looked at us in a different way because he developed that respect because the way he felt and the way he thought and, and the processes he used to get through racism. See, not everybody used the same process. You know, I told you how I came. You know, you fight them, fight you back. Well, Mr. Lee looked at it differently. My father's from Mississippi. His whole family moved up here from Mississippi. So he moved into this area when he was a child. And him and his father um, built homes right behind this church. Um, there was about three homes he built for his family when they came, came up from Mississippi. And they stayed there, you know. He met my mother when he was in eighth grade. My father went to Taft. That's in Washington, D.C. He was an athlete. Baseball was his passion. Hello, everybody, and welcome to tonight's showdown. Griffith Stadium is packed. There's electricity in the air. loved the old Negro Leagues, but he also knew and he also had this passion for getting young men ready to grow up. Everybody has two impulses in life. One is to fly like a bird and to take off, but the other is to stand like a tree in the community.
the one sound that everybody knew was Sunday morning when the church bell rang. And my father rang that bell every Sunday morning. Yeah. He took being the deacon in the church very seriously. But what he did was, he went to the little small individual churches. And spoke to them and created this black basketball league. So each church that had young men, some had less than the others and they would combine them. But we all had league play, and we got a chance to play and laugh and talk and meet people. So it was kind of like two boys clubs in a way, some for blacks, some for whites, depending on who the coach was, you know. But it worked out. White people were, started to come out and got getting involved in the boys and girls club. I played baseball with Mr. Lee, with kids that, from Sandy Spring, who went to Sherwood High School and they would drive that far down because they knew they could come here and play. And there were blacks and whites and Hispanics and we all mixed together. And sometimes there were two teams, sometimes there was three. But uh, we used to go different places. Uh, uh, down in Maryland, play different teams and stuff like that, baseball, basketball. If you couldn't get there, he'll shove you in his car. He had the station wagon and the, the tailgate would be down and we'd be hanging off the back of it just to be stuff as that he'd get us to games with those who couldn't make it to the game or parents who had cars but parents were working and couldn't get their kids to the game. He did it. He would make two trips, three trips, whatever it took. And later on, the white boys started coming with us because really to a point, we were the best. We were the best. Mr. Lee Jordan in his house, in his basement, he must have had over a thousand trophies in there that we won over the years. Lee Jordan, he, he was the athletic director of the world of Tacoma Park. My name is Denny May. I have been a resident of Tacoma Park uh, for 33 years. And I read through Tacoma Park's very well-organized archives online all the city council minutes for two decades. Concentrated on the 1940s and 1950s, particularly in terms of the relationship between uh, the black community and our city government. There was advocacy from the black community over a period of years for a, play a playground for the black community. And we didn't have a playground, so we just played in each other's yards. Or like I said, we went, we played in the woods. We, you know, we did things like that, but not we didn't really have a place to play. And if you read the minutes, you can see that building playgrounds became really important in the 1940s all through town. And there are many, many examples of Spring Park and, and all these other parks getting a lot of attention from the city council. There were playgrounds all through town. all the other playgrounds around were, seg were segregated, so we, we couldn't go. People know Lee Jordan as a, uh, a, a great leader and coach and mentor, but he was also a tireless um, advocate for the black community in, in, with the city council and within the community. The Colored Citizen Association, they were very focused on what it is that they needed to get done, and they were persistent. Eventually, land was found, Lee Jordan found it, uh, and the city purchased three lots. And then the black community was told, um, clear the trees and get rid of all the trash.
Now, I've been reading all these city council minutes over years. I had never seen any other community in town asked to do anything like that. Lee Jordan would come in, he was the president of the association at least for a while, and they'd pass the hat so that they could collect money to be used to clear this playground. A playground was built there over time with the black community having a huge role in getting it prepared. And we had a playground and a baseball diamond. And we had bases. Sometimes you had line painting and sometimes you didn't. Sometimes you played in the outfield, there were holes in the field so when the ball was hit you had to be careful you didn't fall, trip and fall. Yeah, it was an actual diamond. Yeah, and they played, I mean, they had big games there. The older guys uh, used to pitch horseshoes there. And, uh, you know, while they were pitching horseshoes, one of Williams would come up and he would pull out his uh, guitar and amplifier and he would just start playing. So that was our playground, our recreation center, our picnic area, our, our park. It was a feel, <laughs> you know, it was just the way it worked. And you loved it. You loved it because you actually got a chance to go out and compete. I remember that was just like a, the place to go, you know. One Saturday, Mr. Lee said, we're not going to be able to play over young no more. I said, why? They're going to put the park, the trash trucks there. They decided to take the public works and build it on that area, so which eliminated any place that we could have to go and, and, uh, and, and have our playgrounds and things like that for the black community. Lee Jordan and a number of other leaders came in with the petition of 120 people asking the city not to do this right in the middle of the Hill uh, community, the biggest um, component of the African American community. And the mayor allowed Lee Jordan and five members of that group to speak. That was the end of the public discussion about why the Public Works Department was being put right in the middle of the black community. They decided to take that playground, and that was the only place that we could go to play. So we inquired about it and the man said, look, don't come down here because the police will come and get you. Um, but yeah, they took all that away and it just, it was a big part of us. It was really a big part of us. It was just gone. <laughs> So that's when all this started. So 
they, they got together to fight this and told them, if, we, if you do take this, then give us something else. Another place that we could identify with. Part of the deal was uh, a, a, a concrete block um, community center small one was being built on another end of the of the property up there and so finally after 10 years we finally did get Hefner fire it's not that big a place anyway you know it was nice that it was there they put it there because you know people had younger kids they could have birthday parties and stuff like that that recreation center was open to us for girl scouts um, birthday parties um, special events, things like that. And you could go over there, but you couldn't have but so many people in there. And we had a couple parties, the police set out there, because he didn't want people to hang around and drink and all that. Teenagers, a bunch of them never hung out there, never hung around there, because the police go right past there, and they come up in there and check on or like drinking or smoking or anything like that. We wanted to play baseball, we had no place to go. But we all stood out on the street and hung around. So Mr. Lee said, stop worrying about it. I'm handling this. Mr. Lee made sure they could use the athletic field. It was not integrated. He had an arrangement with the, the city to use the fields. Everyone was in Tacoma Park Boys and Girls Club, so they all played baseball together. Most of the time, the boys club was at the junior yard, the field itself. The field itself, he would drive the station wagon up and that's where we would all meet. That's where we would all meet. And so it was really, really, it was really neat. I think sports, brought a lot of those families together, just like it does today. Some of his younger players who had grown up, he began to turn them into basketball coaches. When I was 17, he said to me, he said, I have this little boys team, and I can't find a coach for them. He said, well, I got a coach for the football team, but I knew you played. He said, can you come and just kind of organize the kids for me? And I said, Mr. Lee, I don't know anything about coaching. He said, you played the sport, didn't you, boy? And, you know, we're getting on into the season, and I'm just running them through drills and teaching them little things and trying to develop and turn them into a team. So he shows up with a station wagon full of football equipment. And he said, Saturday morning, have all the kids here, and we're going to all get them all dressed up. And sure enough, he had pants and shoulder pads and mouthpieces and helmets and the works. But I said to him, I said, Mr. Lee, how long is this going to keep up? Because you only said it was going to last a couple of, couple of games. Uh, well, I can't find another coach, another adult to coach him. So you're going to have to hang in there for me. We got to the first game. And I'm looking for the coach. I had developed like three plays. We went out. We won the first game. So the kids are celebrating. Went home. Next game, same thing. No coach. I had to do it. So the season went by. We won the championship. And... <laughs> There was no other one to coach. So that started me at 17, started me coaching. By the end of the season, we were 8-0, hadn't lost a game. And that other guy never showed up. I said, yeah. I said, well, you know, there's always next year. He looked at me and said, no, because I have my coach. And I coached uh, basketball for him. I coached football for him, and I coached baseball for him. And so he literally walked me into coaching kids. I had no intentions on doing that. I was fresh out of the Navy. I had kids and a job, and I just wanted to do that. And 23 years later, you know, I was still doing it. But I just want to say this is year 32 for me 
participating in Tacoma Park Boys and Girls Club. And I went on to coach uh, basketball for like 47, 47 years. What most people don't know is 75% of the kids that played for us couldn't afford to play. Mr. Lee was instrumental in making sure that everyone had an opportunity to participate. It didn't matter where you lived. As long as you could get here, you could play. For the Tacoma Park Boys and Girls Clubs, it was supported by Lee Jordan and his overtime money. It was supported by me and my overtime money. And uh, Sam Abbott, we could always call on him. He would write us a check. Um, but it was all individual. We would knock on your door and ask for loose change. And, and that's how we raised money to buy equipment. When I first started coaching with him, that first group of kids, I wanted to strangle most of them. And we had a short conversation. He said, look, don't worry about not being their parents. Help them be somebody. Every practice, we would sit and talk. And we would talk about everything from hygiene to how you should and shouldn't talk to young girls your age and how you should and shouldn't act in class and why if you're an athlete and you're playing for me, you don't sit in the back of the class, you sit in the front. You let the teacher know that you want an education. All of that came from the way Mr. Lee did things. Let me apologize, the, the volume is all, all the way up on the, uh, on the speaker, so. Uh, if you can't hear me, just, just let me know and I'll try to speak a little bit louder. But I would like to uh, welcome you and good afternoon and welcome to the rededication ceremony for Lee Jordan Field. I just want to th uh, thank the city of Tacoma Park for rededicating this field because this is our dedication number two. And I happen to be here for that one also. What makes Mr. Jordan truly remarkable is that he started this work 80 years ago when segregation still existed all across the, count the country. It was scary, 1957, to come to the big school on the hill. The first person I saw was Lee Jordan. His beautiful, uh, you had to experience the smile. Technically, he was a custodian. But in reality, he was a guidance counselor, a teacher, and a role model. It was just, just so warming, and it just, um, made you want to come on to school. I was one of the people that helped keep the club going. And I never gave a second thought to what we were trying to do, you know, but I knew that Mr. Lee had a vision and I just wanted to help with it. You know, and I felt he had a great vision. And Lee Jordan stood like a tree in this community and sunk very deep roots He loved Tacoma Park. I mean, you know, this was, to him, there was no place else in the world. This was just, this was it. And we see all the extraordinary fruit that has been born in the young people, in the sports that are still going on. The Tacoma Park Boys and Girls Club that he started was the first racially integrated one in Montgomery County. The same was true for many of his teams. The fact that so many people were used to seeing kids play baseball together meant that it was no big deal in Tacoma Park when, when the Supreme Court ordered the desegregation of schools. I guess at 55, we all just went to school. And I think Lee Jordan had a whole lot to do with that kind of, of integration. He wanted Tacoma Park to be a better place for everybody that came here. And that's something I'll never forget. Uh, our Caucasian brothers and sisters, I want people to understand that our Caucasian brothers and sisters that also helped form the Como Park, the African American community had just as much as influence as formed the Como Park to what it is today as they did. And Lee Jordan was somebody who always demonstrated that competition and community have to go together. So that it's not just about who's the fastest and who's the biggest and who wins, it's about including everybody. 
all of us together. And all, and all those people contribute to the community. It was not just one person. Mr. Lee was a center point, but all, everybody had their own little part. It's like the cog in the wheel. Yeah, it's like that.